The Omnivore's Dilemma, The Industrial Food Chain, Chapter 5, Page 59. The Feetlot, Turning Corn into Meat, City of Cows. I was speeding down a ramrod straight road in Finney C County, Kansas, when the empty, dull, tan prairie suddenly turned black. The gently rolling sea of grass became a grid of steel fences as far as the eye could see. In Kansas, that is really far. I had made it to my destination, Pokey Feeders, a feedlot and home to 37,000 head of cattle. The feedlot appeared suddenly, but the stench of the place had been rising for more than a mile. I soon learned why. At first I thought the cattle were standing or lying in a grayish mud. Then it dawned on me. That wasn't mud at all. It was manure. An endless series of cattle pens stretched to the horizon, each one home to a hundred or so animals. The cattle pens, filled with animals and their waste, are built around a corn mill. Twelve hours a day, seven days a week, the mill noisily turns America's river of corn into cattle feed. I traveled to Pokey early one January with a crazy idea of visiting a particular resident. I was looking for a young black steer with three white blazes on his face, the same one I'd met the previous fall on a ranch in South Dakota, 500 miles due north of here. In fact, the steer belonged to me. I'd purchased him an eight, as an eight-month-old calf from the Blair Ranch for $598. I was paying Pokey Feeders a dollar sixty a day for his room and board, all the corn he could eat. My idea was to follow my steer as he traveled through the meat making branch of the industrial food chain, and so I have followed him here. CAFO Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation The old fashioned way of raising cattle, like the old fashioned way of growing corn, was on the small family farm. Cattle were raised in pastures, eating grass and hay, the food they, they food, the food they naturally eat. But as corn took over the family farm, cows and other animals were pushed out. Cattle are now raised in densely packed animal cities like Pockies. These places are called CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. Farmers gave up raising ba cattle because, as strange as it may seem, it costs a farmer more to grow feed than feed corn than it costs a CAFO to buy it. Thanks to these government subsidies, eating meat used to be a special occasion in most American homes. Thanks to CAFOs, meat is now so cheap that many of us eat it three times a day. Of course, the American taxpayer have already paid part of the cost by subsidizing corn. But there are other costs involved in raising cattle. In this way, costs that shoppers don't see when they buy steak at the supermarket. On the old-fashioned farm, there is really no such thing as waste. Animal manure goes back into the fields as fertilizer. But the waste from CAFOs is a huge source of very toxic pollution. Tons of animal manure are produced with no good way of disposing it. The feedlots are also breeding grounds for new and deadly bacteria. Some of these bacteria are finding their way into our food, and there is one there is another cost to raising cattle on CAFOs, one that's even harder to see. These animals have evolved to eat grass, but in a CAFO they are forced to eat corn, at considerable cost to their health, to the health of the land, and ultimately to the health of us, their eaters. Steer number five hundred and thirty four. I first met steer number 534 on the Blair Ranch. 5,500 5, acres of rolling short grass prairie a few miles outside Sturgis, South Dakota. In that part of the pra prairie, you can still make out ruts dug by stagecoaches and cattle drives of the 1800s. In November when I visited, the, cor the ground was covered with a thick coat, coat of yellow and gold grass. Sprinkled across the fields were moving black dots, Angus cows and calves grazing. Ed and Rich Blair run what's called a cow-calf operation. Their business is the first stage in the production of a hamburger. It is also the stage least changed by the modern industrial food chain. 
Beef cattle will get born on thousands of independently owned ranches like theirs. Steer number 534 spent his first six months in those pastures alongside his mother, a cow named 9534. The number means she was a 34th cow born in 1994, 95. His mother never met his father, an Angus by the name of Gar Precision, 1680. Like all beef cattle, 534 is the production of artificial insemination. Born on March 13, 2001, in the birthing shed across the road, 534 and his mother were turned out to pasture just as soon as the 80-pound calf could stand up. Within a few weeks, the calf began riding, adding to his diet of mother's milk. He chose from a salad bar of grasses, western wheatgrass, little bluestern, buffalo grass, green needle grass. Apart from the Saturday in April when he was branded and castrated, one could imagine 534 looking back on those six months as the good old days. No one can really know what a cow feels, but we can say with confidence that a calf grazing on grass is doing what he is supremely well suited to do. Yet after a few months at Pokey, my steer will never have the opportunity to eat green grass again. Cows and Grass, a Partnership Cows have evolved over millions of years to eat grass. It's not a one-sided deal. At the same time, grasses have evolved over millions of years to be eaten by cows. This partnership is one of nature's wonders. When a cow eats grass, it doesn't kill the plant. Grasses have evolved so they can survive being eaten very well as long as the cow gives them a chance to recover. In return for being chewed on, the plants get help from the cows. The cow protects the grass habitat by eating young trees and shrubs that might compete with grasses. The animal also spreads grass seed, plants it with his hoofs, and then fertilizes it with his manure. Only certain animals, including cows, sheep, goats, and bison, can make a meal out of grass. Bison. They can do this because they have a specialized second stomach called a rumen. That's why these animals are called ruminants. Their rum, the rumen is like a 25-gallon fermentation tank. Here's where the cow gets some help. Inside that tank lives a type of bacteria that dines on grass. The bacteria break down the cell walls of the grass and allow the cows to get at the protein and carbohydrates within. Look at the diagram. On the plains of the American West, where Steer 534 was born, Bison and the prairie grasses live together in partnership for thousands of years. I guess we should include the bacteria in that partnership also. It was a natural solar power loop. The plants used the sun's energy to make food. Bison ate the grass and in return ret planted it, fertilized it, and defended its territory. It was a successful ecological system. A rumen has evolved into the perfect organ for digesting grass, but it is not good at digesting corn. So then why is steer number 534 forced to eat corn instead of grass? The answer is one word, speed. Cattle raised on grass simply take longer to grow than cattle raised on corn. In my grandfather's time, cows were four to five years old at slaughter, Rich Blair explained to me. In the 50s, when my father was ranching, it was two to three years old. Now we get there at 14 to 16 months. What gets a steer from 80 to 1,100 1, pounds in 14 months is a tr tremendous amount of corn, food supplements, and drugs. Fast food, indeed. Cow chow. In October, two weeks before I made his acquaintance, steer number 534 was weaned from his mother. Weaning is the hardest time on a ranch for animals and ranches alike. Cows separated from their calves will mope and bellow for days. The calves are prone to getting sick. Calves are weakened, are weaned for a couple of reasons. First, it frees their mothers to have more calves. And second, it gets the calves now five or six hundred pounds ready for life on the feedlot. The calves will round, are rounded up and herded into backgrounding pen. They will spend a couple of months there before boarding the truck for pokey feeders. Think of background, backgrounding as a training school for feedlot life. The animals are, for the first time in their lives, confined to a pen. They are bunk broken, taught to eat from a trowel, and they must gradually get used to eating eating what is for them a new and unnatural diet. Here's where they first eat corn. It was in the backgrounding pen that I first met 534. 
Rather, it's where I picked him out. I had told the Blairs I wanted to follow one of the steers from birth to slaughterhouse. Ed Blair suggested, half-jokingly, that I might as well buy one. Then I could have the whole beef-making experience. He told me how to pick out a good calf, one with a broad straight back and thick shoulders. Basically, you're looking for a sturdy frame on which to hang a lot of meat. I also wanted a calf with a face I could easily spot in the crowd, so I could easily find him again. I went out to the pen and gazed over the sea of 90 black Angus cattle. Almost at once, steer, five num steer number 534 moseyed over to the fence and made eye contact with me. He had a wide, stout, stout frame and three easy-to-spot white marks on his face. He was my boy. New home, new diet. Steer 534 and I traveled from the ranch to the feedlot in separate vehicles the first week of January. It felt a lot like going from the country to the big city. A feedlot is not a very pleasant city, however. It is crowded and filthy and stinking, with open sewers, unpaved roads, and choking air thick with dust. At the center of the feedlot stands the feed mill. That is where three meals a day for 37,000 animals are designed and mixed by computer. A million pounds of feed pass through the mill each day. Every hour of every day, a tractor trailer pulls up to the loading dock to deliver another 50 tons of corn. The driver opens a valve in the belly of the truck and a golden stream of grain begins to flow down a chute into the bowels of the mill. Around to the other side of the building, tanker trucks pump in thousands of gallons of liquefied fat, usually beef fat from a nearby slaughterhouse. There's also the protein supplement, a sticky brown goop made of molasses and urea. Urea is a form of synthetic nitrogen made from natural gas similar to the fertilizer spread on George Naylor's fields. In a shed attached to the mill sit vats of liquid vitamins. Beside them are 50-pound sacks of antibiotic drugs, all along with alfalfa hay and silage, stems and leaves of corn plants. All these ingredients will be automatically blended together to make the feed for the cattle. Three times a day, a parade of dump trucks fills up with this feed and carries it to the cattle pens. Before being put on the strange diet, new arrivals to the feedlot are treated to a few days of fresh, long-stemmed hay. They don't eat on the long ride and can loose up, up to 100 pounds. The hay gives them a chance to get adjusted. Over the next several weeks, they'll gradually step up to a daily ration of 32 pounds of feed, including 24 pounds of corn. That would be enough corn to fill a paper grocery bag. Cattle eating cattle. Feedlots are beef factories. Their goal is to turn corn into beef. But corn isn't the only thing the cattle are fed. You might be as shocked as I was to learn that they also fed parts of other cattle. That's right. These herbivores, natural plant eaters, are fed milk, meat. Forty years leftover beef scraps were ground up and put into cattle feed. After all, it was protein and cattle needed need protein to grow. Then people in England began dying of a sickness called mad cow disease. Mad cow is a brain disease that is always fatal. It is spread by eating the brains of infected animals. Ground up cattle brains were put into the cattle feed and some of those cows got mad cow disease. Human beings who ate infected beef also got the disease. Also, there were no human cases, although there were no human cases reported in the United States. The government banned the practice in 1997, but there are some exceptions. As I already noted, beef tallow fat is one of the ingredients that cows at, Porky, at Pokey eat. Where does the tallow come from? It comes from other cows that have been sent to the slaughterhouse. Though Pokey doesn't do it, the rules also permit feedlots to feed cattle protein from other kinds of, kinds of animals, feather meal and chicken litter, that is bedding, feces, and discarded bits of chicken from chicken farms are accepted cattle feeds, as are chicken, fish, and pig meal. Some public health experts worry that other diseases like mad cow could start to appear because of this sick, of this practice sick from corn. Compared to all the other things we feed cattle these days, 
corn seems positively wholesome. Yet feeding corn to cattle goes against the natural order almost as much feeding them beef. During my day at Pokey, I spend a few hours with Dr. Mel Metzen, the staff veterinarian. Dr. Mel, as he's known at Pokey, runs a team of eight cowboys. Their job is to ride the yard's dusty streets, spotting sick animals, and bringing them into Pokey's three hospitals for treatment. From Dr. Mel, I learned more than any beef eater might want to know about the life of the factory farm steer. Basically, almost all of the cattle in the feedlot are sick, and it's their corn-based diet that makes the mill. They're made to eat forage, Dr. Metzen explained, and we're making them eat grain. Forage means grass. The most serious illness is bloat. Remember, there are bacteria in the animal's rumen, and they produce a lot of gas. Usually, cattle belch a lot to release the gas, but a corn diet causes a condition that keeps the gas from escaping. This is called bloat. The gases in the rumen get trapped, and the rumen inflates like a balloon until it presses against its lungs. To save the animal, a vet must force a, ho a hose down the animal's throat to release the gas. Otherwise, the pressure will choke the animal to death. A corn diet also gives acidosis, too much acid in the rumen. Human stomachs are naturally highly acid. A rumen, however, is naturally neutral or non-acid. Feeding corn to a steer changes the chemistry of the rumen, making it acid and causing a kind of heartburn that in some cases can kill the animal, but usually just makes him sick. Cattle with acetosis stop eating, paint, pant and drool, paw and scratch their bellies and eat dirt. This can so weaken the animal that it can develop a long list of other diseases like diarrhea, ulcers, liver disease, pneumonia, and feedlot polio. Antibiotics for cat animals. Cattle rarely live on feedlot diets for more than 150 days, which might be about as much as their systems can stand. Over time, the acids eat away at the rumen wall, allowing the bacteri bacteria to enter the animal's bloodstream. These microbes wind up in the liver. Between 15% and 30% of feedlot cattle have damaged livers. Dr. Mel told me that in some pens, the figure runs as high as 70%. What keeps a feedlot animal healthy or healthy enough are antibiotics. Most of the antibiotics sold in America today are for animal feed, not for humans. Without these drugs, cattle cannot survive. The only reason they need the drugs is because they are being raised on factory farms and fed corn. The problem is that in response to antibiotics, bacteria can mutate or change. They can develop into new types of bacteria that the drugs don't affect. By giving antibiotics to the millions of cattle in the U.S., we are actually breeding new super bacteria that can be killed by antibiotics. I asked Dr. Mel what would happen if drugs were banned from cattle feed. We'd have a high death rate, he told me. We just couldn't feed them as hard. Hell, if you gave them lots of grass and space, I couldn't have a job. My steer. I found my steer number 534 in pen 63. Pen 63 is about the size of a hockey ring, with a concrete feed bunk along the road and a freshwater trow out back. My first impressions was that his home wasn't too bad. It was far enough from the feed mill to be fairly quiet, and it had a view of what I thought was a pond. Then I noticed the brown scum. The body of water is what is known as a manure lagoon. I asked the feedlot manager why they didn't just use the liquid manure as fertilizer on neighboring farms. The farmers don't want it, he explained. The nitrogen and phosphorus levels are so high that it would kill the crops. He didn't tell me that feedlot wastes only contain toxic chemicals and drugs that end up in the waterways downstream. On a farm, manure would be a source of, of fertility. At a cafe like Pokey, it becomes a toxic waste. I climbed over the railing and joined the 90 steers, which retreated a few lumbering steps. I couldn't find number 534 at first. And then I spotted him, the three white blazes on his face way off in the back. As I gingerly stepped toward him, the shuffling mass of blau black cowhide between us parted, and there stood 534 and I, staring dumbly at each other. I had worn the same orange sweater I had worn at the ranch in South Dakota, 
hoping that maybe he would recognize me. There was no sign that he did. I told myself not to take it personally. After all, 534 and his penmates were bred for their meat, not for their memories. I noticed that his eyes were a little bloodshot. That was probably from all the feedlot dust, which wasn't really dust, but dried up cow manure. Aside from that, it was hard to tell how he was getting on. I don't know enough about cattle to tell you if he was bored or miserable. On the other hand, I would not say he looked happy. Meat machine? My steer had certainly grown. He put on a couple of hundred pounds since I'd seen him last, which of course was the whole point of the feedlot. Dr. Mel complimented me on his size and shape. That's a handsome looking beef you got there, he said. Aw, shucks. There's one way of looking at a steer like 534. The feedlot way, the industrial way. To the industrial food chain, cattle are just machines for turning number two field corn into cuts of beef. So number 534 was doing a good job as a meat machine. Yet standing there, I realized once again, the number 534, despite his name, was not a machine. Number 534 was a living, breathing organism. My health is directly related to his health or to the health of other steers just like him. We live in the same habitat as the animals we eat. Whatever happens to them, happens to us. While I stood in pen 63, a dump truck pulled up alongside the feed bunk and released a golden stream of feed. The black mass of cowhide moved toward the trough for lunch. The dollar sixty a day I was paying for my steer's meal may seem cheap, but it doesn't include all the costs of the industrial farm not by a long shot. It doesn't include the billions that the government spends to subsidize corn. It doesn't include the cost of the environmental from environment from manure, pesticide, and fertilizer pollution. It does include the cost to our health from new super bacteria. I stood alongside 534 as he lowered his big head into the stream of grain. At that moment, I couldn't imagine ever wanting to eat one of these animals. Hungry was the last thing I felt. Yet after enough time goes by and the stink of that place is gone from my nostrils, I will probably eat feedlot meat beef again. Most people can eat feedlot meat because they just don't know where it comes from. For me, it will take a lot of forgetting.